if you have to try uh, too hard, please come closer so that we can be closer to each other and uh, maybe we can even work better, but as you like it. If you've all, if you're already there with the, your laptops on, uh, stay there. But if not, if you haven't sat down yet, come closer, as close as possible. Good afternoon, everybody. Now we're going to start with the lab on secure routing and validation of origin. As we said earlier, this is a continuation of uh, the uh, previous uh, sessions. Here we are going to have a hands-on view of what we saw this morning, and you're going to see how to automate many of the tasks that were mentioned this morning by Erica and myself. Let me introduce your uh, trainers that will be in charge of this tutorial. We have Sylvia Chaez, who's uh, an IT engineer. Sylvia works in CURI, that is Mac the Mexican Academic Network, and in the IXP of Mexico City. Nicolas Antoniello is senior manager of regional technical participation for Latin America and the Caribbean at ICANN. And Santiago Agio is an IT uh, um, engineer in academic and scientific areas, and he works for a CONICET uh, uh, body in Argentina. So now, let's give them the floor. And uh, well, today I also invite you to participate and to ask as many questions as you, you can think of, because uh, let believe me, you can ask them. Uh, um, so welcome to this laboratory. It is, to tell you the truth, it's uh, so, so wonderful to have you here. We're going to try to keep this as dynamic as possible. So please um, get engaged. And uh, because that will create a bit more community for this lab. So you may have seen at the first session, if you, we touched upon a number of topics like as how or to implement uh, safe, secure practices uh, that uh, we need to do as operators to contribute to security. So at this lab that we'll have with Nicolas and Santiago, we are going to go through, first of all, manually, how can we configure these good practices for good operations for RPKIs, and th afterwards we will discuss this with uh, 
Uh, well, well, we'll see what engines we can use uh, to automate the entire process. So let us get started, and we'll explain things. Uh, and now Nico will explain how we're going to do it. Thank you. I'll, I'll stand because I don't like to sit uh, when I'm, uh, and, and as I was given this mic, I always loved this mic, so I, I want to use it. It's like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today's flight will last three hours. I feel like an uh, uh, attendant. Well, as they just said, the idea is to have a practice. This is a lab. And the idea here, for those of you who already took this uh, in previous years, it's very similar, but there are always some issues that arise, something interesting things, some recent problem that was not discussed in the previous year. There's always something happening. So for those of you with a lot of experience and for, for those with medium experience and for those with no experience, if there are people here who are not uh, technical, they're not engineer, you haven't operated a network in your life. You never used a, a commander for, uh, to manage an uh, OS. Well, it's going to be a bit, bit more complicated, but you can still do it. So if you operate with networks, I uh, invite you to, to, to come. And this is recorded. This same lab was done with 12-year-old children, 12-year-olds, yes. And they did it with no problems. Of course, that you learn much more if you know the topic and if you're op used to operating networks. But everybody can do it, even if you don't have any previous experience in network um, administration. If you have any questions, please, there's no such thing as very obvious or silly questions, just ask. No matter how complex you may consider they are, if you don't know the response, you will say, I have no idea, we'll I'll look for the answer. Or we can ask somebody here, there's always somebody who knows more than yourself, and we can debate it all together. And if you think that the question is too obvious, too easy, then ask it anyway. If you have a doubt, just ask, go ahead. Some previous things before we start. The lab is a lab that runs uh, in a uh, server in the cloud, uh, so you do need uh, internet connection. So if anything starts to happen in the wireless and you start having unstable connection, it will be very difficult. The machines here are cable connected. You, we don't depend on Wi-Fi, but we do. Um, we, we have the cables. If there is an absolute disaster, it may happen because it's happened in the past, we are going to switch to a demo mode. So even if you can't uh, use the Wi-Fi, we will move forward all together with the machines that are up here. Uh, hopefully, we won't uh, need to do that. Here we have Juan Carlos. Sorry. Well, we have switches and uh, patchworks. Sorry, we, we, we don't get the translation. He's not using the microphone. If there are not enough switches, well, you can ask for a password. Well, excellent, Juan Carlos. And I didn't know that. And that is really a great innovation, a big step forward. And if Something happens uh, any time. Well, I see that each table has two cabled connections. And as Juan Carlos said, the switches have some free ports. And well, uh, there are uh, free po ports. And uh, well, if you want to make sure that you won't have any problems and you haven't taken any seats, Come here, sit here, use a patchwork, and use the cable network. You will need a card, a network card, because machines don't bring one. That is absolutely a hateful uh, thing by a 
It would have been very easy to bring a one by one uh, centimeter with a connector. So uh, uh, now we have to uh, use a uh, hundred cables, and uh, almost nobody brings it. But you have the connections if you have a network card. As I was telling you, this lab uh, it runs. Uh, in the cloud, so you need internet connection to have access to it. And the only thing that you will need to access is a browser. You may use uh, an, uh, any browser. Any of the best known should work right. It's been proven with Safari. If you're using Safari in Mac or with Chrome, with any OS, and with the rest of the browsers, <laughs> I wish you the best. If you have Chrome or a Safari, even if you hate them, I recommend you to use them, at least today, because certainly everything will work fine. Nico, something that is very important to mention and also uh, to promote uh, participation. Pay attention, try to follow this lab, because at the end we will have some questions and we are here, we, we have here some prices. I'm from Mexico, I brought chamoy. Uh, it was uh, in the last time, uh, but this is chamoy. Well, I was going to take one of those little bottles, uh, so it's good that you mentioned that it was not for me. So the operative systems, we tried this uh, lab with them, Linux, Windows, OS Max, OS X, uh, Chromebook, oh, also do a good job. Uh, mobile phones, forget it. Don't do this because you won't be able to write fast uh, enough and copy and paste, and you'll need to copy and paste many, many things. And uh, and uh, I wish you the best success if you want to use a, a tablet. It's difficult, but if not, take your l l netbook or um, do it with uh, your neighbor if the, your neighbor has a lap laptop. We have the capacity for 100 participants, but if we have more participants, you will have to get together in greater groups. We can only have 100. And the lab has been configured for that amount of people. So the lab runs on a server in the Amazon cloud in the state of Virginia. Uh, now, prior to that, how can you access the lab? You can get a URL. And when you join, you're going to be have a username and a password. Just write that once. I just realized that people are interpreting my presentations. They hate me because I speak so fast. I'm so sorry. Apologies to the interpreters. So once you access the URL, you have to use a username and the password, the same one for everyone, and just write it once. Once you have your username and your password, and we, you will get a screen with an enormous list of groups, group one, group two, group three, until group 100. It starts from group six, because groups from one through five are the ones we use for the purpose of the practice session. And then we have from group number six to through to 100, so that each one of you can use one of these groups. So once you access the group, you have to look for the group that has been assigned to you. Once you access that group, you have to use only that group that has been assigned to you. The lab doesn't have lots and lots of security measures so that nobody can access the other, someone else's group. So if you want to access someone else's group just because you feel like it, and if we detect that, you're going to be thrown out of the room. But the lab has been prepared so that everyone in good faith can collaborate. So don't enter a group that has not been assigned to you. Otherwise, you'll be stepping on each other's configurations and we'll be working on the same devices and it won't work. What are the div devices that we're going to use? We're going to use a router. Each one of you will have a router. This is a soft router. 
This is FRR software. Maybe some of you are familiar with that, and also Quagga. The FRR is uh, for the development of Quagga, same thing, but with a different name. It stopped being called Quagga at a given point, and it began to be called FRR. This is quite a powerful router, powerful software, and you can just do anything with that router, the same as with an enormous router like Juniper, Cisco, Alcatel, Huawei. It has all these capabilities of any router. And then the command line is a copy of Cisco's command line. Sorry, sorry, I said Cis copy of Cisco's, but it is, in fact. And this was done on purpose to make things easy because Cisco did a great job and teaching people to manage routers with their devices. So when these people developed Quagga many years ago, said, why are we going to do something different? If everyone knows, is familiar with the Cisco commands, and make, make life easy for everyone else. What else? You have a router, you have a client. The FRR right, router is working on a Linux OS, an Ubuntu server, 20.04, which will have to migrate to the new stable version 20.04, but it's working fine. And it's an Ubuntu server, and this has to be used as a client server to do trace and to analyze and generate traffic and analyze a couple of things. So what are we going to do? We're going to get the router. We're going to each one of you will have a router, an autonomous system, and each one of you will connect. We're going to be part of the say, a traffic exchange point. So we'll have to connect your router first to the traffic exchange point, to the central point, which is managed by us. Only we have access to that. Once you connect to that central router, we'll start receiving a lot of routes from that central router. The laboratory is no simulation, and that's important. It's not a simulation. Once you you have a real router, the software, but it's real router, you're going to connect to a real router, and that central router you don't have access to is connected to a router of an internet service providers, and the routes that you receive are real routes live from the global routing table. You didn't inject the global routing table, because you can imagine there are 100 routers running on a virtual machine. So if we multiply that by the 1,500,000 routes, then basically we run out of a virtual machine because we add up, we use up all the memory. So what we're going to do is to filter this and only give you 30 or 20 something IPv4 routes and some more of IPv6 routes. In the laboratory, the entire laboratory will be done on IPv6 because this is the way it should be done. Nico, I am sharing the diagram so that you can better understand Yes, what Sylvia just shared with us is the network topology. Each one will have this network. What you see in yellow, RTRX, will be the router that you will have to configure. And what you have up there, E border RTR, is a central traffic exchange point router. And you'll have to pick a BGP session there. So you need to establish uh, IP4 BGP session and IPv6 BGP session. Although we'll be working on IPv6, we're going to enable the two BGP sessions. The entire laboratory will be dual stack. The entire laboratory has IPv4 and IPv6. We're going to set up all that, and after all the tests and after analyzing all the prefixes, we're going to do the GP and RPKI, will be done for an IPv6 prefix. What you see over here, which is CLI, CLI, it's client. And to access the router and the client, once you reach this screen, you only have to stand on that router, click there, and you will get a terminal with a command line in your browser with access to the router. And we'll be doing this step by step, nevertheless. So 
This is as follows. This laboratory has been designed so it can only be done by the people who are here in the room. Some people are, have joined us remotely and can follow the laboratory, can follow the explanations. You will see in the Zoom what we are doing, and everything we do will be shared, both the configurations and what we are analy analyzing, but the only ones who can do this practice session are those who are present in the room. Now, this is for security reasons and to simplify things. So, Santiago will be giving out a piece of paper. That piece of paper contains all the information you need to access the laboratory. It contains the group GRP1, for example. I'm group one. So, mine will say GRP1. Then you will have a URL, which is URL you have to write to access the laboratory. Once you write that URL, you'll be asked for a username and a password. The username is GRP, and if you the group number, GRP 1 or 2 or GRP 72, then you write GRP 72, which would be your username. Okay, I, I did something wrong. Sorry, the username is the same for everyone and the password is the same for everyone. I'm not going to read this out loud and don't tell anyone the username is personal. So it wasn't what he was saying first. It's not for those who are connected remotely, not for the person sitting next to you. You all have the same user, but please don't share the password or the username with anyone. If you wish to access the laboratory and you don't have this slip of paper, please let us know. We'll give you the piece of paper and you automatically will have your username and password. And the final announcement is the following. And this is for the technical guys. So we have many issues as technical guys. We have some advantages, we have some problems. And we don't like to read the manuals. Just when everything crashes, then we go to the manuals. But you have buttons, and I show these to a client. If they do something wrong, something will happen always. Because first they press on the button, and then they go to the manual. We all do the same. Now, the other thing we have as techies, if we know something, we like to do that before they tell us to do something. So don't do anything. Don't start, at least until we finish the lab. Then you can break everything you wish. But until the lab finishes, don't do anything. Unless you know exactly what you have to do, don't do so. Wait until we let you know, and we go step by step all together. So not going to be as fast as we would like, but we're going to be safe as we go along, step by step. But we have to advance at the same pace. <laughs> Nico, in the website, in the material that you shared, in the website, you don't have the URL of the lab. You have to enter with this one here. The URL for the lab is the one that you have there in uh, the slip of paper. It's what you have there. Yes, it's just for you to consider. Yes, the information to access the lab is on uh, that strip of paper, and you'll have to use it only once. And once you have access to the network topology and the screen, that's it. So. Uh, we entered the same in the network, username, uh, password, you look at the piece of paper, look for the group, your group, and how do you know whether you're in the right group? Because on top of that, uh, of everything, where you have the topology, you, it sh you should see your number, please. Check that you are not in the wrong group, and if if that's the case, go back in the browser and go back to the right group. So, is anybody here in the room? Is there anybody here that uh, lacks the piece of paper to access the lab? And raise your hand up here so that we can see you. Ready, steady, go. Well, I don't know if if it's after 50, 
36 that's ours as a 36 oh we we started with problems because i saw and that you are ill that there's another group that has well just give me a second i'm going to try to fix that while everybody has access to your lab if you are among those groups that couldn't access bear with me a minute uh, refresh the side and go try to go back to your group but i'm going to try to correct it as soon as possible if any of the newcomers wants to wants one of these uh, uh, slips of paper you can ask erica So there were questions. Somebody was asking about the password. It's E, capital letter, no, it's L. No, I won't say the, the entire thing. No, the only thing that is all in uh, uppercase is icon. Well, you can change the number in your URL. If you connect and it gives you a number that's not appropriate, you can uh, change that easily. Yes, if you have a group over 50, you'll, you'll be in trouble. I'm fixing that. When I created the groups, something was uh, wrong. So if you refresh the website where you have a list of all the groups, you should be able to access the right group. If you cannot, please let me know because we have to change it again, but uh, by now it should uh, be uh, solved. So we don't see what's being shared at the back. The back screen, please. Okay. Gracias. Y bueno, ya ahorita, uh, uh, so now, those of you who understand how the lab is going to work, well, Nico already explained what we are going to do. This is just for you to consider that we have our uh, edge line, the border line, that is the group that is going to give us the output. But each of the in each of the groups, with this router, router in yellow, that is R T R X, and the X stands for your group number. And this is what we are going to configure from now on. So we are going to have a client in our network. And later on, we are going to see the RPKI validators. If you see it, it's in the border line. And we are going to have two servers for these actions. All right. So. You, what you should see now, when you accessed the lab, you should uh, have uh, seen that screen if you click on the right group. Now, my question is, is there anybody who hasn't been able to reach this screen yet? Raise your hand. If you 
Don't see the screen, let us know because you won't be able to do anything. Up there, my group, is, well, it says GRP1, my group is one, group one, so please make sure that yours is the right group. So, if you go back to the screen with the list, up there it says lab guide. If you put access, you'll see another screen that opens with the lab guide. Everything's wrong, we did everything wrong. Yes, this one works. Now it's the user's problem. This time it's the user's problem. So you should have been able to reach the screen that has the lab guide. So and what are the advantages for this? First of all, that you won't have it to uh, try too hard. That if if because if the letters are too small and in much of the lab. Um, it, there are many things that you are going to copy and paste from there. Most of the configuration we're going to explain, but then afterwards you won't have to write them line by line because it would take hours just to configure so anything. So you are you are going to copy and paste in the router. So, but uh, please don't start pasting things in the router because there are things that need to be changed before. Um, if you um, uh, you have to start uh, deleting things. No, so go little by little. Here, if you are in a hurry, certainly you would do things wrong. The first thing that we saw in this guideline is a description of uh, the lab configuration. Let's go quickly. There's information on the IPv4 and IPv6 addressing systems, and as a rule of thumb in all the parts of the guideline that says where it says x you have to replace that x for your group number if you are group one you put one group seven group 25 whatever replace the x with your group number so let us start with the lab. In this first part, you don't have to do anything. You merely have to pay attention to the screen, listen, and make any comments or questions. The first thing that we'll do at the lab is to explain once again the configuration. So we said we are part of an IXP. We here, we implemented the central router of the IXP. You are all members of that same IXP. You have a border router there. It's the only one you have. And you want to connect it to the IXP so that you can start exchanging routes with the IXP. So we are going to start two uh, BGP sessions, one IPv4, one IPv6, to exchange uh, the uh, dual stack. And so, once you're done with that, you'll see how many routes uh, we are going to update that. And then what we're going to do is to configure in each of the routers, you're going to config to connect your router to an RPKI validator. We have implemented two RPKI validators that run in the Ford validator. It's one of the existing softwares. If you implement this at home, you may implement it with uh, the software you prefer. We use Ford, and those validators will give a router all uh, the RPKI validation info, and route the router will use it to identify the state of each of the routes in the BGP tables. So please remember this morning explanations on RPKI. <laughs> and uh, you you were there this morning. This is the practical part. So having connected the router, the the router will start showing in the each BGP table the uh, validation status for each uh, uh, route, and uh, then we will 
uh, simulate an attack, a type of attack. And you'll have to identify what sort of attack it is. And we're going to use BGP filters based on RPKI. Each of you will apply a BGP filter, a filter to neutralize that attack. It's a real router. It's no simulation, but nothing. None of your publications is going to appear in the internet because we don't mean to do any uh, network uh, um, hijacking. So whatever we do, if we do evil things, they will be limited to the lab, but because you will see real routes. And when you do three, you see that it goes outside of the lab to any corner of the world. So as we move along, we'll uh, make comments, some, some comments on uh, good configuration practices and RPKI configuration alternatives, where we configure the filters that we configure, how we're going to configure them. And before that, for a rapid uh, uh, view, well, today Guillermo and uh, Erika showed you the theoretical part. The idea is to show you on the screen you don't have access to the RPKI validators, but we're going to show part of the configuration on the screen here, and we're going. I'm going to walk you through. Well, Santiago is going to. Well, whenever I say Santiago, I have to think it five times because I'm used to calling him a colo from for now. I'm just going to call him a colo. I'm no longer Santiago. So. Santiago Asha is Colo. So Colo will explain the basic things about uh, the configuration of the RPK validator. And at the end of the lab, we're going to give you some URLs. In the same uh, GitHub uh, project, there are tutorials in Spanish and in English how to configure an RPKI validator. The people of Nick BR have those same videos in Portuguese. So there's a lot of information about how to configure uh, a, an RPKI validator from scratch if you want it to uh, repeat all this experience in real life. So, Colo, if you agree, I will access the server and you can explain the configurations. So, as Nico just explained, we're going to have a look at the configuration of a validator. It's a Fort validator. And if you go through the screen in the browser, basically what Fort has is a configuration file, a JSON type file. And some of the items that we'll be looking into, it's not that the others are not important, but we don't use these in the laboratory. So what you will see here is something that we call TAL, and a directory, which is where we st store the TAL files. These are the trusted files at the five R's have available and the validators download. When the validation cycle begins of a validator, the first thing it does is to download these five files. We'll look at this in a while. So from then on, these files have the address from where to extract the objects and the corresponding key for each, from each RIR to verify this. After that, you'll find other directories as a repository, then another protocol that is used for the objects. Here we use rsync, but we also have HTTPS. Then the part we're most interested in is the one that interacts against the router. So where you see server, you see the port that I'm going to use. In the laboratory, use port 323, and then values as to how the router will request the information from the validator. Here you have the interval during which the objects are valid, the refresh, which is 900 seconds, the retry, which will be every 600 seconds, and the expire, which is 7,200. Further down, you will find 
Another parameter, which is output. There you have a file that you will be generating, which is called Fort Roas. Dot CSV. If you look at the validators, you will find the five TAL files of the five RIRs. And now Nico will take over. But here you see how the validation is restarted. Here, Fort is executed with an initialization of the TAL files. So you will find that directory when you have the validator in your networks. You restart it. And then you have an example of the parameters you will have. You won't be interacting with this, but we will now see how you can simulate being a router. So let us do the first task. It's not in the website, but you will be executing this. I will share with you a command to install the library. What we're going to do with that library is to use a client called RTR. The RTR protocol is the one used to exchange objects, the rowers, between the validator and the router. So the command you will be executing is sudo apt install and the library librtr0. One comment, just one comment. Please be patient once you execute that. It might take some time until it sets this up. We are supposed to having done that previously, but we did not do so. So when you all run the installation, each of the machines you will be using at the same time will start to download that package and install it. So please be patient. Don't get nervous if it takes some time. This is you do this you do on the client. You have to enter the device that is CLI. You have to enter CLI in this topology. You access this device here, CLI for client. You click with the mouse there, and the command line will open of the client server there. Well, you, you write sudo space apt space install space and the name of the library, libr-tr-0, and enter. And if it asks, just put y, yes, install. And there you install the library. So I'll be walking around to see if anyone has any questions and needs assistance. Did anyone manage to install it already? Raise your hand. OK. Raise your hand. Who has not been able to install it so we can help you? So everyone can install it. Great. Mm -hmm. 
So we go back to the page. And once we install the library, we're going to execute this command over here, RTR client, with this parameter over here. So what it's going to do is to, in a CSV format in this file, ROS.CSV, and it's going to connect through TCP IP to one of the addresses of the validators, which is this one here, 100.64.0.70, and it will use port 323. Like Colo explained, you can copy and paste the entire line. And that's it. So like Colo is saying, what you will do here is to download from the validator all the list of the prefixes that have a ROA. And this will be saved in a local file with that name, with a name roa.csv. So we'll do the following. In the command is executed in a by mode, and you'll see some of the parameters that we just mentioned that have the validator. Validator assumes that our CLI, that our Linux is a router, and it's asking for the ROAs. So there, you will see what we saw just now in the expiration time, which is 7,200 seconds, the refresh time. And this does synchronization. And then we'll generate the ROAS CSV file. So what we're going to do now, what we're going to do now is that if you have already declared your ROAS, you can look this up in that file. Colo, let me add something. There's something interesting here to, that would, is worth mentioning. If you look up here, there is a line over here. This line over here. Thank you, Colo, for <laughs> scrolling down. 6,200 6, prefixes. So these validators over here, the RPK validators, are no simulation. These are real validators that are being download that are downloading the information from the ROAs, the ROAs that the five regional registries aim at. And correct me if I'm mistaken, but that would be the total number of IPv4 plus IPv6 prefixes that the ROA has, a declared ROA has, in the entire internet. So if you work for an organization, and you have autonomous system, you have IP4 and IP6 prefixes, and you created the ROAs, your prefixes are included in those 666,248 prefixes that you have just downloaded to your clients. So what you can do is in that ROAS.csv file that you now have locally in your client, there you can look up information, you can look for your prefixes, the prefixes of your organization. You won't be able to look for these up linearly because there are 616,000 lines. It's a bit long, it's a bit big file to look these up manually. So you have to do some search mechanism. So would anyone like to volunteer to give us your ESNs or your prefixes? Who has an autonomous system? Raise your hand. And if you created your ROAS, over there. Could you please go up to the microphone, state your name, organization, and autonomous system name? Good afternoon. I'm sorry, the, the, there's a lot of feedback with the microphone. Autonomous system. 14, 2, 3, 2. So if the prefix don't appear here, we did something wrong with the validator, or these were not created. So hopefully the prefixes appear. So there they are.
So nine prefixes in IPv4 plus IPv6, the three IPv6 prefixes and six IPv4 prefixes, each with the rowers that were created. There you have the network size, the first value after the prefix. And then the second value following the prefix is LE. So that is the range, the mask range. When I created the rower, when you create a rower, you specify the prefix for which you create the rower and the maximum disaggregation of that prefix. In this case over here, 138 to 1940 slash 22, they enabled maximum disaggregation of 22. Because it's a slash 22 maximum disaggregation, it matches this exactly or it doesn't match the rower. And the last one is the autonomous system number associated to that prefix. So the autonomous system that for that rower has the authorization to generate the publication of that prefix. So whoever validates this or verifies the validation status of 138.219.22, if that prefix in the AS path does not appear as having been originated in the autonomous system 14.232, this one will have a validation generated status. What will be the validation status of a prefix if it appears in the internet and originated by an origin that is not the one authorized in the ROA? Invalid, exactly. So any origin that is not 14232 for those prefixes will appear as an invalid prefix. Let's clarify that there, there's one that shouldn't be there because the filter is wrong, but just in case, where is it? 214, well, that shouldn't be there, yes, because the filter picks everything that has a 14, 232, including the things that have uh, other numbers before them. But actually, it's five uh, uh, IPv4 prefixes and three IPv6. There's an autonomous system that shouldn't be there. It's not yours. But that is because of the filter, because the way we wrote it. Okay, so... You can change the autonomous system in the search mechanism in the grip before putting 1432. Uh, you put uh, the autonomous system you like, and you should be able to visualize all the rowers that you created for that AS. You At the lab, um, as we put this together to, to, to implement today's lab, we had delegated, LACNIC had delegated a prefix for uh, research purposes, for training purposes, as we are doing now, and an, an IPv6 prefix we have delegated, and we have an autonomous system that is uh, 134. Uh, 235, and you'll see that it's registered at the name of one of us, but it's a prefix that we use at LACNAC for trainings like this. And these, this is the prefix that LACNIC delegated. Uh, um, uh, this is uh, a slash 34 IPv6. These are the are the rules uh, that uh, have an autonomous system that is authorized to generate uh, the publication of that prefix. So far, uh, I, I just showed what we had seen this morning, all the theory of RPKI and how we implement it in a validator. In this case, it's a fourth validator. Any questions so far? Any doubts or comments? Please come closer to the mic, say who you are, your organization, so that we we all get to meet each other. Sebastian of the Covelco Cooperative Argentina. I have a doubt. Why don't we install in the client? Is this for practical purposes? Because for operations, it shouldn't be like this. Yes, this is just for you to see how to search for an autonomous system and the prefixes. This is just a demo. Yes. Anyway, 
You will use it for research purposes and other things that well, you may need to get the rowers without being a router. It's a way you can see it and to see how it interacts. And as a matter of fact, if you add what Kolo said, it's a very useful tool. If you have an RPKI installed and you have a router linked to it, and I work at uh, the operations center that uh, administer all that, well, if I'm allowed, it's an excellent tool to install in your machines, in your laptop or your PC or whatever machine you use to operate. You install the RTR and the router emulator, and you can give commands to the RPKI validator, pretending to be a router. So you can interact with the RPKI just the same way, uh, but only that you're not touching the router, because there you can see how things were done. If anything is happening, you don't need to get into the router. I can look at everything from my machine interacting with the RPKI validator. So this is a tool that that allows you to clear problems, and it's very useful. So let's go on. So now, let me show you the nicest thing, the most interesting. That, that is the configuration with each of the routers. And first, le very briefly, let me tell you what the uh, central router is like. This is the router that we configured. You don't have access to it, but you are going to establish the BGP sessions. And we're going to look at here. We're going to see how it's configured. This is uh, the guide and practice. The letters there are rather small, but you can see the same thing. So this central uh, router, we, we named it eBorder. Uh, in our PR, it's an, well, it's a one like the you would minister. And this is the router configuration. The same thing here, if you have access to a router and you look at the configuration, it's it, it, it gets deployed if you execute the command show run, the famous command. We can see the configuration of the Cisco router. There it says the FRR version. This is the, the last for the Ubuntu 20.04. It has some static uh, uh, parts, and the central router of the IXP has the autonomous system 65,000, and each of you will use the autonomous system 65,000 something. That something will be the number of the group that you have been assigned. So if you have group 57, it's going to be, you are going to be autonomous system um, 65, 57. If you are five, it's, you're going to be 65, 005. And that autonomous system is the one that you'll have to use when you configure the BGP process in the router. We'll reach there. And then here, you have all the BGP uh, configurations. The only one that's lacking is, um, uh, uh, well, if you do it in your side, if you do it automatically, some a few seconds later, you should be able to raise the BGP session because it's pre-configured. It's all been pre-configured in the central router. There are 100 BGP sessions. Well, not 100, 200. 100 for IPv4, 100 for IPv6, pre-configured in the central router. And some additional BGP sessions that are established within the central um, and the BGP that that is passing all the internet routes. In addition to that, well, let's go quickly through this. And I'll just uh, check the initial configuration of the border route of your devices. Before we do that, let me make a couple of comments. One additional comment on things you shouldn't do. When you access the router, the router has a minimum configuration that's pre-made. It has interfaces defined, IP addresses, etc., etc. By no means, unless you, well, you, you uh, don't have a lab, should you 
change anything that has been pre-configured. Do not change the uh, addresses of the interfaces. Don't add configurations. Don't remove configurations because that router that you have access to, that's the router that is giving you uh, the internet output to your lab. If you are standing on a branch and uh, you cut the branch you're standing on, it's not like the roadrunner that will remain there in the air. No, you will fall because that's going giving you the connectivity. If you change the IP address, then you won't be able to have access to the router. You'll lose connection, and that's it for you. So, don't change uh, the configuration of the routers. Yes, we'll have access to routers. To do so, please go to the network uh, topography topology. You step on uh, the yellow router. You click on it with your mouse, and you'll see, be patient, you'll see the command line of the router, and there you are, you're already connected. Access the router. Is there anybody here who couldn't access the router? Do you see anything different from this? Okay, something that may happen, and I'm telling you now because you will all see this, if you have this for a long time and you don't do anything, I did it wrong. When I tell I tell you all not to do that, well, she did it. She went too fast. She shouldn't have. If we leave this here for some time, we're going to lose connection, and we're going to receive a message uh, with that message. So close the window, go back to the network diagram. You click on the router again, and it will reopen. Don't worry if the window closes, because you won't lose what you've done. The router continues to run. You just lost, co lost connection. But whatever you did, you configured, or you're still configuring, won't be lost except for the last uh, uh, row if you didn't uh, uh, click and enter. So don't worry. If you lose connection, go back to the graph and you uh, connect to the to router again. So as Sylvia said, the first thing that you'll do is to execute the first command in your router. Show run, that's up there. It's abbreviated. You can abbreviate the commands in Cisco. We won't give you the details, but write sh space run enter. And that shows the router configuration. If the router configuration is too long, then you'll see many screens and you can move uh, up and down scrolling and you can go through all the configuration. The pre-configured part of the router is a couple of uh, static routes by default in IPv4, or by default in IPv6 that uh, aim at the gateway at the lab and, pro and uh, provides internet connection to the lab. It's the route that uh, makes it possible for you to be connected to your lab. And then there are four interfaces, five interfaces, T, H, uh, T, uh, H, one, two, three, and four. Each interface corresponds to each of the networks in uh, the network diagram on the other screen. And one of those networks that is connected to the router is what the client has. So the router is the one that provides uh, internet uh, output to, to the client. So all the traffic is going through the network to uh, go back later. And, well, that's it. That's a configuration of the router, almost nothing, the minimum thing so that you can connect and just that. So the first thing that we are going to do, going back to the guide and practice, is to start doing, uh, configuring the router. I now give the floor to Silvia. And what I'm going to do is I will execute the commands that she will explain on the screen, just the way you'll do it at all times in each of your routers. So each of us will configure the router. I do mine one, and you do yours. So the important thing to check is the part of the diagram so that we can check it. 
como bien nos um, so that we can check that what we are going, doing now as Nico mentioned we are going to enter the router and then we are going to configure what you we need to so uh, we are enter and as the guide is showing us we are going to copy and paste what we have there configured and as you realize these are some filters these are prefixes so if you realize we are going to have some filters where we are going to deny well we are our IPv4 and IPv6 filters where we are going to deny uh, and enable everything related to IPv4 and IPv6 that we need to so as to keep, keep control uh, this is one of the good practices in the manners and there we are going to apply in a roadmap we are going to apply all our filters so we just uh, put copy and paste in those filters we have and we are going to either enable everything or nothing and somehow we are going to enter in our RPKI roadmap we will do match with these validators that have been checked and of course we will have uh, two roadmaps and where are we going to uh, so uh, we the first one is going to be 200 copy paste copy and paste well just uh, to configure the router once we are in the router just as you executed the command to configure the router for those of you who don't know it you need to execute a command to have access to the router mode uh, router configuration mode is conf space and the t for terminal or you write configure space terminal so there you can see it would host it and that's enough let me see whether I can expand it a bit I magnify it a bit so the filters from the global configuration mode we will see BGP configuration but directly you can access configuration mode we do copy paste of the filters so from the practice guide you select the filters you select you copy you put conf t right button and click the entire configuration once we paste the configuration if you pay attention you will note that at the end of the configuration it is in the route map configuration mode so to exit that hierarchy of the router configuration you have to write once or several times the exit command you put exit you're in configuration mode and if you put exit again we exit the configuration mode and we are at the router now if by mistake you write exit you will be disconnecting from the router wow i disconnected nothing's wrong nothing happens you go to the network topology and you access the router once again you didn't delete your configuration. What you already configured is there. So now we have the BGP configuration. We're now going to see that we all, we all have an autonomous system that has been assigned to us. So let us now put the 
BGP router, each of us will have our own autonomous system, which is how the internet works. So we will have two BGP sessions, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. And you saw in the guide, we're going to be doing these and we'll be applying policies of the roadmaps to have all the prefixes that we will be receiving from the border because as we can see, this is a network diagram that we had at the beginning. This is a network topology. Here we have the green router on the red line, which is a border line. On the yellow line, we're doing a BGP session towards the border, both in IPv4 and in IPv6. So to configure the BGP session, you cannot copy and paste the entire configuration because there are some X's. So the first two lines will have to be one done one by one, and then we can copy and paste. So don't hurry up now. So we're going to do the following. You're going to access the router once again. You click on the, on the router, you do configuration, conf T, and there we'll enable the BGP process. To enable the BGP process, the command is router, BGP, and the autonomous system number. I'm group one, so my autonomous system will be 65001. If you are the autonomous system 27, you have to write 65027. Remember, you have to fi have five digits, 65,000 and the group number at the end. In my case, it's 65001. I click Enter. I now already create the BGP process, so I'll now start co to configure the BGP process. So do that part and wait there. Enter the configuration mode and create your BGP session with the autonomous system n number. If anyone needs any assistance, just feel free to ask us. That's what we're here for. Raise your hand, tell me, get lost. I don't know how to go on. I wasn't paying attention. Uh, so if you just need any help, let us know. But the idea is that everyone does this. Now, if you are unable to do so and you don't raise a hand, your hand, you won't be able to do the rest of the lab. If you skip one step, you won't be able to do the rest of the lab because everyone needs to do this so that we can proceed afterwards. So once we access this and create a BGP process, the following line that we'll execute is this one over here, BGP router ID. So when you create a BGP process in a router, the way the BGP system works, the routing standard for BGP, this requires that you assign the router an identifier, which is router ID, the router identifier. So BGP, when you enable BGP, the routers will start to interact with their neighbors. So those routers, so that I know who my neighbors are, so I can identify the neighbors and reference them, each router has to have a name. So that is router ID. It's the name the router has for the BGP process, and they all have to be different. We cannot repeat the names. If we have two routers in the same network with the same router ID, problem. That's a problem, a serious problem, in fact. So things, strange things will start to happen. So the router IDs have to be unique. You cannot have a network with a BGP protocol that has been implemented containing two routers with the same router ID. If there's different autonomous systems, nothing happens, but within the same autonomous system, you cannot repeat the router ID. And this cannot repeat from one router of the AS to a different router if they are connected with one another. But let us not go into those details. So to make sure that we don't repeat the router IDs, what we're going to use is an IP address that is unique for each 
as a route ID. So this allows us to be sure that they're all different because we'll all be in the same network connected to the central router. So we copy this configuration line, copy. We go to the router. We are still in the BGP configuration mode. We paste this, but we don't press enter. We have to delete X and put our group number. So the IP address, the last octet, has to be our group number because I'm group number one. BGP router ID 100.64.1.1. If you're group 28, it will end in dot .28. And then enter. So there we have our BGP process with the router ID assigned. And now we go back to the configuration and all the rest of the configuration from the next line, BGP log neighbor changes from then through to the end. All the rest of the configuration can be selected. We copy and we paste it. The rest of the configuration is identical for all. Now, why is this identical? Because the rest of the configuration establishes the BGP connection between your router and the central router. So all the information contained there has to do with the central router. And because the central router is the same for all, configuration is identical to all as from here. So we can just copy and paste it. As you can see, the central router has the autonomous system number 65,000. And this is what we have to write to do this, both in IPv4 and IPv6. That's why you have two families. You will note they have address family IPv4 and address family IPv6. The, here you have for the BGP session IPv4 and BGP IPv6 for transfer the IPv6 prefixes. So these are IPv4 addresses, 100 footballs, etc. And FD3967 DB colon colon 10 is the IPv6 address of the same central router. So once you paste that configuration on the router, you press enter a couple of times to make sure that the configuration is there. And then we write exit twice, once and then again. And we get out of the configuration mode and we have the router with the configured BGP session. So at this stage, it should have already started the BGP session. As you can see in the guide, so let's look at our router. We have show IPv6 in any, any cast summary. Here we have the IPv6 BGP session. So we go to the router, we ex ex execute the command show BGP, show right at the top, show IP, show BGP IPv6 unicast summary. Yeah, that right at the top. And what it displays there is the configuration of all the neighbors, all the BGP sessions that were established secrets about that were configured in my BGP process for peers IPv6 and this is the IP v 6 address of our central router and if you pay attention if everything is fine you have the IP address and then it says the autonomous sister of my peer, of my neighbor, against whom I'm using the BGP session, as establishing a BGP session. So here you have to have 65,000 as the autonomous system number. S27 will normally coincide. It should coincide in most of cases. So that's the number of BGP messages that were sent and received that will continue to increase. So whenever BGP message has changed, that increases this number. And then, if you pay attention, there is a 35. 
and then several values, and then at the end, these last two values, 34 and 34, these are the number of IPv6 prefixes received and the IPv6 messages that were sent. So what this 34 indicates is that the central router is sending me 34 IPv6 prefixes. And because there's no filter at all, basically I'm rebounding everything that is published, so I'm going back to teaching all the peers the same 34 prefixes that were shown to me. So of course, those who know how BGP works, BGP has an essential feature, which is called divided horizon, which basically, although I teach a router, I can teach a router what it teaches me, if I teach someone exactly the same thing that it taught me, that router does accept the 34 prefixes. These are being eliminated by the router because it knows that these prefixes were taught by the router. So it cannot, it won't include them in its routing table. So those prefixes are generated by Autonomous System 65,000 and the prepend. And otherwise, you would be breaking the protocol. So it wouldn't work. <laughs> It starts building a routing loop, and it eats up all the router's memory, among other things. So we'll go over to visualizing the routing table. Let's see the four prefixes to visualize the router table and the router. There are several options. This is a classical option show BGP IPv6 unicast. This will show me the entire BGP table, not the routing table of the router. It's not the routing table. I repeat, it's not the routing table. It's not this. The routing table is not the same thing as a BGP table. This is a BGP table. So if a BGP table thing ends up having things in the router table, it's entirely a different situation, but this is not the routing table. And we're not going to start discussing distributions. It's not the topic of this tutorial. You just shouldn't be inserting this liberally into the table. So we have 34 paths here. And this is important. Uh, paths are not routes, uh, so uh, because uh, uh, the route is something that, that they send me, while the path needs to be uh, viable. And in a, under certain configurations, I can receive two routes. I, I may have two paths for the same route, so you put the the, the path. The number of paths may be greater because. I may have multiple paths for a single route that can be achieved uh, through a special configuration that is the BGP multipath, but it needs to be enabled because by default it is not an a enabled and we won't uh, uh, enable it. But remember that you may have more than one uh, valid path for the same destination. So just uh, by way of example, there you have uh, the Nodwork 2001 7FB EF00 colon colon slash 48. That prefix and the next hop is uh, F80, FE80, that's self configuration of the interfaces. But believe me that that FE80 colon colon 216 uh, colon 3EF. Well, that's the center, that's uh, the IXP configuration. The next stop for my router, the BGP, it makes sense for it to be the central uh, router because this is where I raise the BGP session. It's my peer, sort of. So, and then you have uh, the AS path for that route. Remember that the, the AS path is red. Uh, 
from right to left. So what is the number of the autonomous system that is generating this uh, last one, this uh, 2001, 7FB, uh, EF01, slash 48? Could somebody tell me? It's not the central router. Those of you who said that, you're wrong. That it goes from the beginning to the end, from right to uh, left. So you have to go to the end, uh, and by the E, it says, so it's correct to those that says 1200, uh, 654, that's the autonomous system that is uh, generating that prefix. Oh, and that prefix, that must be 12,654, it sounds like uh, somebody that's uh, a few hops away from here quite a few kilometers away. And the autonomous system, then it skips to the uh, to the 60, and it uh, hops from one place to the other until it reaches 6435, that is the IXP that gives us the internet connection, and, and then uh, finally the central point 65,000, and then to your own route. Okay, so if you look at this, now we are going to check what is it that we have to configure. Well, Nico already showed us the BGP table and the autonomous system, the space that we are announcing. And now we'll check the RPKI validators. So remember that uh, Depending on the diagram up here, you're going to see, you see that we are going to have two validators, RPKI1 and RPKI2. So now in a router, we are going to configure the uh, what corresponds to each of these validators. And although, So we'll have RPKI1 is going to have IP 164070, and then RPKI2 ends with uh, 0.71. So we do this through the TCP port that we're going to configure. In this case, it's three port 323. And we're going to sp specify what each prefers. And uh, to that end, you may remember that we uh, indicate our preference. Here we are going to see. I don't know whether you remember who had uh, the uh, high preference uh, uh, based on what we put in the roadmap. Well, here we would have our configuration as such. And we are going to enter our route in the configuration mode. And we enter the RPKI part. There you are. And there you can copy and paste. You can copy the entire block, including RPKI, and you go to the router and you paste it there. Just that. There. We paste it, we configure, we exit to be able to verify our show uh, RPKI cache. You may realize that here we have the RPKI. Our configuration, and we are now connecting with the validator that is point 70. Do you see? There we have connect in brackets. So far, so good. Is, and does anybody need any help? Anybody who couldn't make it here? 
Okay, perfect. So now let's go and see the validation state with a prefix in particular. And now Collar will help you. To check the state. What we are going to do while she configures, she copies the command from now on, we'll take this prefix as an example and we'll use it throughout the practice today. We will see what happens with the prefix. The prefix that we're going to use as an example is 2803-9910-8000 colon colon slash 48. That is an IPv6 prefix, a sub-prefix that has been assigned. Uh, the prefix that we told at the beginning that we are assigned at Lucknow for these tutorials, we are going to use that prefix. That is part of uh, do you remember that we had a slash 32 assigned? We are going to use this slash 48 as an example, and we'll uh, use that throughout the practice. So we are going to visualize the status of our PKI for that prefix. What does the router do when I request the status of the RPKI in the prefix? The router will query the BGP table, will look for that prefix, and will show me the validation status assigned to that prefix in the BGP table. Why? Because the BGP table is added the validation. Why do we add the validation status? Because we just we uh, used it with uh, we updated it with the uh, from the RPKI validator, and we have all the prefixes uh, with uh, our uh, with rows created. It takes all the prefixes it took from the validator and all those that match, it will put them in the st uh, validation status uh, um, in the BGP table and uh, seeing if the AS path that appears in the BGP table, whether it has the autonomous system for which the role was created, it's going to be valid. If the prefix was published initially in an autonomous system that does not match the one that was downloaded from uh, the RPK validator, the status will be invalid. And if the BGP prefix has no entries in uh, what is downloaded from the RPK validator, it means that there are no rows validated for that prefix. And what is the status for such uh, prefixes? How do you call it? Sorry, I can't hear. Louder. Non-existent? No. Yes, it's valid. Invalid and not found, not found. The prefixes that have a, a row created, oh, it's no exist, non-existent or not found. So here we execute. And if you realize to your left, you see the uppercase. Uh, if you visualize uh, the BGP table with BGP, well, with the summary here, you see a column at the beginning. It was not there earlier. That has the validation status for each. V for valid, uh, I for invalid, and N is for not found. Up there it says in the reference. I don't. I don't remember whether it was an N for not found. So it's V for valid, I for invalid, and N for not found. RPKI validation codes. So it's V, I, N. That column, if I'm not uh, connected uh, to an, uh, it won't appear. OK. So we are going to check it specifically, this segment that was mentioned by Nico, 2803-9910-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8000-8
colon colon one. In this case, we bring it. And you can also copy and paste uh, the command uh, Unicast, etc. You paste it on your router, you execute, and it shows you only the info about that prefix, not the entire BGP table, but just for that prefix. And if you look at that, for that prefix, it shows the AS path that is much, much shorter because it was originated in 64135 and then it goes to the uh, AS 65000 and uh, then from the central one it comes uh, that is connected to the internet through Lucknowga uh, path. So, but it originated in the 64135 that is Lucknowga autonomous system. So, what should be the state? Indeed, it's valid because the rower that was created for that prefix was created to authorize that prefix to be published, generated by the autonomous system 64135. Uh, 64, so far, so good. Yeah, so far, so good. Remember that this part of the validation, this is what you do to have a better uh, routing and a s more secure, uh, that you know who it belongs to. And these are the only ones that, that can propagate. Just um, um, so this is why we're doing all this to provide, put more security in our routers. So there we only validate the uh, proper origin, and we can uh, prevent uh, router hijacks. So there, let me give the floor to Colo. Thank you. Before the break, what we'll do is to execute a command. So we'll try and reach this IPv6 address that we saw before, 2803-9910-8000 colon colon 1. In the guide, you can copy and paste, and we leave that running. Everyone is in the router. Okay, this is in the CLI, on the client. He wants to go to the coffee break, so he skipped all the rest. So now go back to the topology and access the client. Leave the router there and go to the client. You would find the MTR anyway. So access the client. Execute the MTR client. The MTR is the same as a trace route, but a bit more complicated, com uh, sophisticated rather. Um, we're going to create that. We're going to leave that running. After the break, we will continue to see what will happen with route hijacking. Now, a brief comment before we go to the coffee break. If you pay attention, in fact, what the MTR does is the same as a trace route, and among other things, the most important thing is that it does a kind of a trace route, and it starts increasing this. It's, it's like the trace route. It increases one by one the number of hops that I allow that message to do, so as to identify this, the same as a trace route. It has to identify all the hops provided, given by this information from my router, from my client, to the destination I established. So every time that that packet changes network, it will show a hop. The hops are the number of networks it goes through to reach destination. It grows from one network to another only, it's one hop. If I go through another network in between, it's a further hop. So it's no longer the screen. But what you have in the MTR are all the routers, all the changes in network, 
of that packet. So if you pay attention, that leaves the laboratory network. It goes through the internet, through to a given point, and in a, to a given moment, it says waiting for reply. Because that specific IP address, let me clarify this, with Lacnox IP, this hasn't been assigned to any specific device. So once it reaches Lacnox, because there's no device with that IP address, nobody will respond. That is why, in the end, it says waiting for reply because the last hop has no response because nothing has been addressed assigned to that IP address. So that information ends there. That's the final hop, 2620.107. 8,000 slash 24 in IPv6. So before we close this and go to the break, we're going to do the hijack, and after the break, we will continue. So what you have to do now is to click R in the MTR. So, as Kolo was saying, what we're going to do now, we're going to simulate an attack, and we'll see what happens with the path followed by this information. So we click R, we refresh, and now we reach that IP. To refresh the MTR, you press the key R, so what previously was reaching a given place, you only have three hops. It stops there, and it reaches an entirely different place compared to the previous one. So we will stop here. Let's go to the coffee break. We resume at 4.30. Don't forget, it's 4 p.m. We resume at 4.30 sharp. We leave, leave the attack for later. So this is not what you would normally do if you're under an attack. But we'll have a coffee break now.